Hi everyone, welcome again to the course of structural biology. We are continuing through structural biology techniques. We have already discussed about high resolution technique like X-ray crystallography, NMR. Currently, we are talking about low resolution techniques, the solution techniques majorly on the category of spectroscopy. Today, I am going to discuss fluorescence. So, to introduce fluorescence, you know when a molecule absorb light, then a lot of electronic phenomena are used to take in place. An electron after absorbing light is promoted to the higher excited state. It is generally should be a singlet state, but there are exceptions it would also be a triplet state. The excited state can get depopulated in several ways. So, if you know in spectroscopy we are always talking about two different states. You have a low energy stable state which is mostly populated and high energy excited state which is less populated. So, when a molecule absorb energy become excited go to the higher population state it come back, but coming back would be in several way giving rise to several spectroscopy as we are talking about. So, how the excited state can get depopulated? One, the molecule which is going to the excited state can lose its energy non-radiatively by giving its energy to another absorbing species in its immediate vicinity which is called as energy transfer or by collision with other species in the medium. If an excited state triplet overlap with the excited state singlet, the molecule can cross over into this triplet state known as inter system crossing. So, what is happening? We have discussed about that there is a state and it have vibrational states and then there is a excited state. This is ground state and this is excited state. So, a electron goes from here to here and then come back, but it could go to the covering second state. So, this is singlet, it is going to a triplet state that is inter system crossing. If the molecule then returns to the ground state singlet, so, it goes from S0 to S1 and then go to T1, then come to S0, then this phenomena is called phosphorescence. So, if you see here S0 goes to S1 by being excited. Now, in several ways it is coming through quenching, through energy transfer and these are called non radiative transfer. If it comes from S1 to S0, then this is called fluorescence. If it goes to T1 by inter system crossing and then come back, these are radiative transfer and this is called phosphorescence. So, the molecule can partially dissipate its energy by undergoing conformational changes and relax to the lowest vibrational level of the excited state in a process called vibrational relaxation. If the molecule is rigid and cannot vibrationally relax to the ground state, it then returns to the ground state S1 to S0 by emitting light. This process is called fluorescence which we are going to study in this module. When we are studying this, the diagram which used to show this phenomenon are known as Jablonowski diagram. It is named after the Polish physicist Alexander Jablonowski who illustrate the electronic state of a molecule and the transition between them, the molecular phenomena, the molecular interactions. The states are arranged vertically by energy and grouped 
horizontally by spin multiplicity. The transitions are indicated by straight arrows as you see the electronic states are further divided with. So, these are electronic states and the further divisions are different vibrational state. This is singlet to singlet to singlet and this is triplet. So, if singlet goes to triplet and then come back this is interconversion. So, that is the total phenomenon. Coming to a very important thing in fluorescence which is called stoke shift. The stoke shift is the gap between the maximum of the first absorption band and the maxima of the fluorescence spectrum. So, if you see this is the absorption band and this is the emission band. The energy of emission is typically less than that of absorption because if you remember from the ground electronic state to the excited state the molecule goes, then it dissipate the energy and come back that is fluorescence. So, there is a dissipation of energy in any form and that is why the emission energy is typically less. Fluorescence typically occurs at lower energies or longer wavelengths. This is due to loss of vibrational energy in the excited state as heat by collision with solvent. So, if you see there are vibrational states. So, when it travel from one excited state to another excited state and then it lose the vibrational state to come to the higher vibrational state to the lower vibrational state that is why it lose the energy and that is why it is typically occur at lower energy. So, these are some of the examples this is fluorescence and you see the absorption and fluorescence emission this is DNA bound ethidium bromide ethidium bromide when it is alone in the solution it does not show any fluorescence, but when it bind to DNA only that time it is showing fluorescence 7 amino 4 methyl coumarin or AMC you again see the profile. So, what are the time scale of those conversion for absorption the time scale is 10 to the power minus 15 second for vibrational relaxation 10 to the power minus 12 to 10 to the power minus 10 second for lifetime of the excited state S1 10 to the power minus 10 to 10 to the power minus 7 second intersystem crossing 10 to the power minus 10 to 10 to the power minus 8 second internal conversion 10 to the power minus 11 to 10 to the power minus 9 second lifetime of the excited state T1 10 to the power minus 6 to 1 second. So, if you see here the transitions happens and timelines are given among them the lifetime of the excited state S1 which is 10 to the power minus 10 to 10 to the power minus 7 second this is fluorescence. The lifetime of the excited state T1 is actually defining phosphorescence. Some important facts upon return to the ground state the fluorophore can return to any of the ground state vibrational level. The spacing of vibrational energy level of the excited state is similar to that of the ground state. 
The consequence of above 2 is that the emission spectrum is typically a mirror image of the absorption spectrum of the S0 to S1 transition. Quantum yield, quantum yield is very important. It is the number of fluorescence quanta emitted divided by number of quanta absorbed to a singlet excited state. Alternatively, it could be also told quantum yield is the ratio of photons emitted to photon absorbed by the system. So, number of photons emitted by number of photons absorb this ratio is called quantum yield. In the latter sections, we will talk about quantum yield and its application. The molecule with higher quantum yield, we use them as probe. Fluorescence lifetime and quantum yield. Quantum yield is the ratio of the number of photons emitted to number absorbed as I told the lifetime of the excited state is defined by the average time the molecules spend in the excited state prior to the return of the ground state. Q, Q generally, this is a, I should say that generally we use Q for quencher, but here Q is used for quantum yield tau by tau plus K n r and small tau is the lifetime 1 by tau plus K n r where tau is the emissive rate of the fluorophore, it is characteristic to any fluorophore and KNR is the rate of non-radiative decay. Fluorescence lifetime and quantum yield. The lifetime of fluorophore in the absence of radiative process is called intrinsic or natural lifetime. Fluorescence lifetimes are near 10 nanosecond as we have shown earlier. Scintillators have large tau value, hence they have large quantum yield and lifetime. The fluorescence emission of aromatic substances containing nitro group are generally weak due to their large K inner value. Tau n equal to 1 by tau, so it is inversely proportional. Quantum yield have to be determined with respect to some standard, so here there are some standards CY3 with quantum yield 4 and quantum yield is characteristic in a certain buffer. So, this quantum yield of CY3 is measured in the PBS buffer. CY5 quantum yield is 27 and it measured in PBS also. Cassile violet quantum yield 53, solvent is methanol, fluorosane 95, 0.1 molar NaOH 22 degree centigrade. Pop up 97 solvent cyclohexane, quinine sulfate 58, 0.1 molar H2SO4 at 22 degree, rhodamine 101, quantum yield 100 in ethanol, rhodamine 6G 95 in water, rhodamine B 31 in water, tryptophan the amino acid 13 in water at 20 degree, L tyrosine 14 in water. They also have their characteristic excitation and that is where it clicked. So, you have to excite at a particular wavelength and then you get the emission spectra. This is the internal setup of the instrumentation. You have the light source, then you have the excitation monochromator and the initial light ray energy will go and hit the sample and then this is the cubit of the sample, then you get the intensity of the fluorophore which is coming and this will come through the emission monochromator and it would be 
detected by a particular fluorescence detector. So, the excitation spectrum is the fluorescence intensity at a particular fixed wavelength is measured as a function of the excitation wavelength. Emission spectrum is the excitation wavelength is kept constant and fluorescence intensity measured as a function of wavelength that is spectrum of the emitted light is determined. You have seen the excitation and emission spectra so we have already discussed. So, this comes through this process. The effect of solvent of the fluorescent spectra, the effect of solvent and environment may be due to several factors. Solvent polarity and viscosity play a major role. Rate of the solvent relaxation, so that is why I was telling when you have to talk about quantum yield, when you have to talk about the fluorescence spectra, these are dependent on what type of environment you are developing, like what type of temperature, what type of solvent, these are the two major factor. Probe conformational changes, rigidity of the local environment which is characteristic of the molecule probably, internal charge transfer and proton transfer and excited state reaction probe, probe interaction. So, typically the fluorophore has a larger dipole moment in the excited state than the ground state. Solvent shifts the emission to lower energy due to stabilization of the excited state by the polar solvent molecule. So, with less polar and more polar, you will see different effect. As the solvent polarity is increased, this effect become larger. So, if you see here a fluorescent spectra taken for prodan where solvents are used from hepten to water from non polar to polar and you see several different spectra are obtained. So, emission spectra is collected of prodan in different solvent increase in solvent polarity leads to red shift effect of temperature 100 k to 300 k, 3 points are taken and there is clear shifting of the spectra. So, decrease in temperature means increase in viscosity because when you increase the temperature the dynamicity would be enhanced. So, decrease in the temperature is decrease in the dynamism which means increase in viscosity which ultimately increase the fluorescence contribution of non relaxed state resulting blue shift. So, I talked about red shift, I talked about blue shift, what is red shift and what is blue shift. A spectral shift towards higher wavelengths that is lower energy and lower frequency is called a red shift or a bathochromic shift. So, if you see here, here this shift is red shift because here from lower wavelength to higher wavelength happened the shift of the emission spectra with the change of the solvent when the polarity of the solvent is enhanced. Whereas, here when temperature is increased the opposite effect was observed from the higher energy to lower energy the emission spectra is shifted. So, that is called blue shift. So, a spectral shift towards lower wavelengths which is higher energy and higher frequency is called a blue shift or hypsochromic shift. Fluorescence could be used as a pH indicator. Fluorescence spectra of some molecules are sensitive to pH thanks to an equilibrium between the 
protonated and deprotonated form of the fluorophore which differ in the spectral property. So, pH what it will do? If you have 7 pH you increase to 14 or you decrease to 0. This is your pH scale. When you increase the concentration of OH minus would increase, so it will take the proton. When you have going there H plus would increase, so you have the proton of the fluorophore intact. So, when you change the pH the fluorophore would have retain its proton or not. Okay. So, fluorescence spectra of some molecules are sensitive to pH thanks to an equilibrium between protonated and deprotonated from the fluorophore which differ in spectral properties. Fluorescence spectroscopy can measure pH inside of cells and cellular compartments. Modern pH sensitive dyes can be genetically encoded to highly specific location. Okay. So, if you see here relative fluorescence is measured with the change of pH it start with 5. 5.5, 6, 6.6, 6, 7, 7.5, 9 and when you do that you see the changes which is plotted to get a correlation. That is why fluorescence here working as a pH indicator. Coming to quenching. Fluorescence quenching refer to any process that decreases the fluorescence intensity of a sample. A variety of molecular association can result in quenching. This include excited state reactions, molecular rearrangements, energy transfer, ground state complex formation and collisional quenching. Who are quencher? A variety of substances could act as quenchers of fluorescence. Quenching by oxygen is due to its paramagnetic nature causes the fluorophore to undergo inter-system crossing to the triplet state. Quenching can occur during the excited state lifetime. For example, collisional quenching, energy transfer, charge transfer reactions, photochemical reactions or they could occur due to formation of complexes in the ground state. So, when the molecule goes in the excited state, quencher could go and interact or they could form complex in the ground state. We will focus on two type of quenching, one is collisional or dynamic quenching, another one is static quenching. So, in collisional they keep interacting, in static they form complexes. Collisional or dynamic quenching, collisional quenching occurs when the excited fluorophore experiences contact with an atom or molecule that can facilitate non-radiative transition to the ground state. Some common quenchers include oxygen, iodide ion and acrylamide. So, when you see a molecule it get excited and give radiative transfer. So, excited state molecule return to ground state via emission of a photon. It goes to the excited state, it gives back a photon and come back. 
the same molecule it interact with a quencher come back to the ground state, but could not provide a photon. Excited state molecule collides with quencher molecule and return to ground state non radiatively. So, no fluorescence or less fluorescence is observed. Now, you could quantitatively measure the effect of collisional or dynamic quenching. How? In the simplest case of collisional quenching, the relation is called stern volmer equation. So, stern volmer is F0 by F, where F0 and F are the fluorescence intensities observed in the absence and presence of the quencher equal to 1 plus k s v into q, where q is the quencher concentration and k s v is the stern volmer quenching constant. So, here f 0 is the fluorescence intensity, this is the fluorescence intensity with no quencher, F is the fluorescence intensity with quencher. So, this is giving you the measurement how the quencher is influencing by getting the ratio of F0 by F. Okay. Ksb is the stern volmer constant and Q concentration is the concentration of the quencher. What is the importance of this equation? If you plot F0 by F versus Q concentration, it should yield a straight line with a slope, the slope is k s b. This plot as I told known as stern volmer plot is helping you getting the factors. So, suppose you want to see the effect of a quencher the effect of a quencher is characteristic of this stern volmer constant. So, you could measure that from this plot. So, k s v equal to k q tau 0, where k q is the bimolecular quenching rate constant, which is proportional to the sum of the diffusion coefficient for fluorophore and quencher and tau 0 is the excited state lifetime in the absence of quencher. Stern volmer was F0 by F equal to 1 plus Ksb into Q concentration. Now, when Ksb equal to Kq tau 0 for purely collisional quenching, which is as I told also known as dynamic quenching, that k q tau 0 would be replacing here. So, tau 0 by tau equal to 1 plus k q tau 0 q concentration. So, in the fluorescent iodide system, you know the value of tau 0 and k q, you could measure the other ones. Coming to static quenching, in some cases, the fluorophore can form a stable complex with another molecule. So, up to now we are talking about dynamic interaction. Now, we are talking about stable complex and when they could form stable complex, this is known as static quenching. If this ground state is non-fluorescent, then we say that the fluorophore has been statically quenched. 
In such a case, the dependence of the fluorescence as a function of the quencher concentration follows the relation F0 by F equal to 1 plus K A Q. So, K S V, the stern volmer is now replaced by K A, where K A is the association constant of the complex such cases of quenching via complex formation was first described by Giorgio Weber. So, if you see the ground state fluorophore is there, it is not bound to the non fluorescent quencher, but the now they are bound and it formed the ground state complex. So, the static quenching only affects the complex fluorophore, it would not, it would not affect the fluorophores which are open, while in dynamic it could interact with any of them. The properties of the uncomplex fluorophore are not changed, they show property of a normal fluorophore. Quenching and lifetime of fluorophore. Static quenching will not reduce the lifetime of the sample since those fluorophores which are not complex working like a normal one and hence are able to emit after excitation. We will have normal excited state properties. The fluorescence of the sample is reduced since the quencher is essentially reducing the number of fluorophores because there are suppose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, they have taken 2 of them. So, they are now 4, so they change and that is how it is affecting. So, if you see in dynamic quenching, this is the plot of F0 by F and this is the plot of tau 0 by T is mostly same, whereas in case of static quenching, this is the F0 by F, whereas tau 0 by T it is straight line because here tau 0 equal to tau. In both static and dynamic quenching, sometime both the things occurs together, both the static and the dynamic quenching together. So, now they have F0 by F equal to, so F0 by F equal to 1 plus k is v into q which is 1 plus k q tau 0 into q for dynamic for static 1 plus k a into q here it would be coming together 1 plus k q tau 0 concentration q 1 plus k a q both of the factor will come and they would be multiplied. In such a case a plot of F0 by F versus q will give an upward curving plot, it will give an upward curving plot rather than a straight one. The upward curving is because of the Q is present in 2, so you are multiplying that, you are getting the effect of Q square. So, the upward curvature occurs because of the Q square term in the equation. Now, when you put tau 0 by t, you still get a straight line. Why? Since the lifetime is unaffected by the presence of the quencher in case of pure static quenching, the plot of I would say tau 0 by tau versus q would give a straight line. Coming to Foster's resonance energy transfer or FRET, FRET what 
is the concept of fret. If you have a fluorophore, you excite. So, you have fluorophore A, you excite. So, you have a emission, you have a excitation wavelength, you get a emission. Interestingly, if that emission wavelength actually come in the range of the excitation wavelength of a molecule B, instead of getting the emission of A and B, you get a very big resonating emission peak and this relation is known as fret or Foster resonance energy transfer. So, fluorescence emission from a donor is absorbed by the acceptor as I told it is emitting it gives energy to A. The emission spectrum of donor and absorption spectrum of acceptor must have a spectral overlap that is the relation of two molecule being into fret relation. So, this is the donor molecule, this one, this is the acceptor molecule, they are overlapping. The emission spectra of the donor is overlapping with the absorption spectra or excitation spectra of the acceptor. Fret is a non radiative process. The fret efficiency is dependent on the distance between the donor and acceptor. Fret is a very interesting concept and a lot of background research have developed. In 1918, J. Perrin proposed the mechanism of resonance energy transfer. By the way, if I just want to give your memory a little bit refresher. If you remember the nuclear overhauser effect, here also we are tracking two hydrogen if they are interacting or not. So, you could think this as a similar effect if two probes come close to each other and they are in fret relation instead of getting small small emissions you get a resonating emission. In 1922, J. Carrier and J. Frank demonstrate the excitation of a mixture of mercury and thallium atomic vapors with 254 nanometer. The mercury resonance line also displayed thallium emission at 535 nanometer. In 1924, E. Gavioland P. brings some observed that an increase in the concentration of fluorescein in viscous solvent was accompanied by a progressive depolarization of the emission. In 1928, H. Kalmanad F. London develop the quantum theory of resonance energy transfer between various atoms in the gas phase. The dipole dipole interaction and the parameter R 0 are used for the first time. In 1932, a Perrin published a quantum mechanical theory of energy transfer between molecules of the same species in solution. Qualitative discussion of the effect of the spectral overlap between the emission spectrum of the donor and the absorption spectrum of the acceptor. So, the first concept come and finally, 1946 to 49 T Foster in whose name today we know developed the first quantitative theory of molecular resonance energy transfer. So, without going into much depth, I just want to say that this relation freight is used globally as a molecular probe. The condition is the donor and the acceptor 
would be in a distance where freight relation should be valid. Here you see a lot of molecules like pyrene, lordan, cis trans, perinuric acid, cholestratrienol, damsel, they all are actually having freight relation with tryptophan and why that is important? We are going in the next session where we will see that there are three aromatic amino acids present in protein which are tyrosine, tryptophan and phenylalanine. Among them tryptophan is the mostly available and that is why so many studies are done. But there are other pairs like pyrene with rhodopsin retinal group, body pi with Texas red, DCIA with NBD and A dance with NBD. All you see there is a foster radius in angstrom. Freight is distance dependent. We have seen that here you see when the, the relation when it is you see this is distance dependent the r is the distance and when you see the efficacy the efficacy reduced with distance. Now, this is what we know more interestingly if you see that in some of the pair at least people have found that when they have change in the angle when the angle comes at 90 degree there is no fret. So, we know that fret is distant dependence, distant dependence of the fret is known, but new research is also upcoming with the angle dependence of fret. As I told fluorophores in biology very important intrinsic fluorophores in protein include tryptophan, tyrosine and phenylalanine. Tryptophan and tyrosine give stronger spectra than phenylalanine and tyrosine is frequently quenched as a result of proton transfer in the excited state. So, which one would be your use? You have tryptophan, tyrosine and phenylalanine. Phenylalanine have low quantum yield and tyrosine because of its phenolic proton it could be resonance stable in a quinone form. So, it lose the proton in the excited state. The basis of DNA nucleotides and of some cofactor like NAD are also intrinsic fluorophores although the produced spectras are quite weak. So, as I told tryptophan is very important when it is concerned to the fluorophore study of fluorescence of protein. Tryptophan the dominant intrinsic fluorophore a protein may possess just one or a few tryptophan residues which facilitates interpretation of the spectral data. Tryptophan is very sensitive to its local environment. It is possible to see changes in emission spectra in response to conformational changes, subunit association, substrate binding, denaturation and anything that affects the local environment surrounding the indoldering. Indoldering have the reason of the fluorescence, but here are something else. What is something else? See tryptophan is quite a big molecule. This is the tryptophan moiety, right? Now, why tryptophan is so important? Suppose this tryptophan is present inside the hydrophobic core of the protein. Now, when you add some heat, thermal energy or change the pH or add some denaturing agent, what will happen? For most of the soluble protein, you will see the possible opening. Now, when the protein start opening, 
tryptophan would be more exposed to water. So, there would be continuous shifting and depending on that or operating this, if you are lucky enough to have one tryptophan, you could even calculate quantitative rates. It is also possible for ligand binding and anything which change the conformation of the protein. Tryptophan appears to be uniquely sensitive to collisional quenching either by externally added quencher or by nearby groups in the protein. Tyrosine it is partially hydrophobic, tyrosine prefers to be buried in protein hydrophobic cores. Tyrosine involved in stacking with other aromatic side chains. Tyrosine contents reactive hydroxyl group thus making it much more likely to be involved in interaction with non-protein atoms as well as it a lot of time lose the proton. Phenylalanine it is hydrophobic, phenylalanine prefers to be buried in protein hydrophobic cores. The aromatic side chain can also mean that phenylalanine is involved in stacking interaction with other aromatic amino acid side chains. The phenylalanine side chain is fairly non-reactive and is thus rarely directly involved in protein function though it can play a role in substrate recognition and that could be taken care. Here is the data of tryptophan, this is tyrosine, this is phenylalanine. If you see all of them have fair lifetime 2.6 nanosecond, 3.6 and 6.4, absorption wavelength 280, 274, 257, but absorptivity 5000 600 for tryptophan, 1400 for tyrosine and 200 for phenylalanine. Also the quantum yield is 0 0.2 for tryptophan, 0 0.14 for tyrosine and only 0 0.04 for phenylalanine. So, if we look at other amino acids in general hydrophobic amino acids can be involved in binding recognition of hydrophobic ligands such as lipids and those interactions could be studied using fluorescent spectra if we have a proper lipid containing fluorescent group. Aromatic residues can also be involved in interaction with non-protein ligands that themselves contain aromatic groups via stacking interaction which could again be studied using fluorescent spectroscopy. A common role of tyrosine within intracellular protein is phosphorylation that could trap through differential fluorescent spectra. Protein kinases frequently attach phosphates to tyrosines in order to facilitate the signal transduction process. Protein kinases are highly specific, tyrosine kinases generally do not work on serine and threonine and vice versa. So, this could be trapped. Folding study could be performed using fluorescent spectroscopy targeting tryptophan mainly but also tyrosine as internal and ANS as external flow force. So, I talked about whenever you are actually providing energy like thermal energy to the protein, what will happen? The soluble protein will start opening up, right? So, you have folding state and you get unfolding, right? not interesting, but sometime it could be very interesting when you have the folded one, you put heat, it is open up, right. Instead of opening like that, it open up with some hydrophobic clusters being retained that is called molten globule state. If your protein is in a molten globule state that could have been very, very critical for the functional operation of the protein and you could detect that by the help of ANS. How? So, you start melting your protein 
and then you add a n s if your protein would be in molten globule in that only state it would bind to a n s and you get a very very significant spectra otherwise you will not so in that way you could get folding to molten globule to unfolding and also a differentiative state of molten globule. So, this is really interesting information to obtain. Fluorescence spectroscopy in biology analytical assays for organic compounds to get the metabolic pathways, structural local conformation of aromatic amino acids, tertiary structure, denaturation transitions, binding studies, fluorescence microscopy is very popular. Fluorescence is more sensitive to fluorophore environment than UV visible spectroscopy due to increased time the molecule stays in the excited state. And when I was talking about fluorescence microscopy, it remind me with the one of the best innovation of this century which have changed the way we look at biology. It is called green fluorescence protein. So, what is green fluorescence protein? It is a protein which existed for more than 160 million years in one of the species called jellyfish Aquaria victoria. I am very excited about this protein. So, if I start I could have talked about thousands of stories, but with considering the limited time I would restrict my talk to few of the stories which you should know. And when you say GFP green fluorescence protein you should immediately remember the name of Osamu Shimomura who is the father of this protein. So, Osamu Shimomura was the first person to isolate green fluorescence protein and to find out which part of the green fluorescence protein was responsible for its fluorescence. His meticulous research laid the solid foundation on which GFP revolution was built. This jellyfish produces green bioluminescence from small photo organs located in its umbrella. So, if you see this is the umbrella of the jellyfish and these small white things are the photo organs. When the rings of 20 to 30 jellyfish are squeezed through a ray on gauze, a faintly luminescent liquid called squeezet is obtained. This is the squeezet, this green thing. Simomura went to Friday Harbor in Washington to collect this squeezet and to extract from its substance responsible for its luminescence. Simomura estimate by its own that he collected over a million of aquaria specimens cut off the ring this ring and produce squeezet to conduct his research. So, green fluorescence protein was good, but it was not perfect for biology to use. The person who have changed this, who have converted the green fluorescence protein to enhanced green fluorescence protein and then there are series enhanced blue fluorescence protein, enhanced cyan fluorescence protein, enhanced any color you say enhanced cherry and also these are enhanced ones and the M ones the M honeydew, M banana, M orange they are all monomers. So, Roger sign is responsible for much of our understanding of how GFP works. His research is responsible for developing new techniques and mutants of GFP. I will try to talk about this little bit. This is like volume of work. His group has developed mutant that start fluorescing faster than wild type GFP that are brighter and have different colors. 
Martin Chalfi, another landmark, another legend in GFP, his graduate student Ghia Yusrekchen successfully incorporated GFP into the E. coli. This is the first time they have expressed this gene in other organism. They published that result in science. Douglas Prasser. Douglas Prasser was not at the initial activities, but he was the first person to realize the potential of GFP as a tracer molecule. In 1987, he got the idea that sparked the GFP revolution. So, GFP as I told was good, was good marker, but the idea to use GFP as a tracer molecule was the key of this revolution. He thought that GFP from a jellyfish could be used to report when a protein was being made in a cell. Major breakthrough in GFP application came when Sergei Lukinov found some GFP like protein in corals. His finding DS red resulted in the discovery of many new GFP like protein in non bioluminescent and sometime even non fluorescent marine organism. So, what Sergei did? So, when green fluorescence protein is getting up like popularity, people are happy with that, and especially Roger Slab is coming out with different other colors, but then someone have to think out of the box and it is Sergei's lab who actually focused on corals and find out new protein and when they got it, other people jumped on and nowadays there are many, many other proteins other than GFP. In 2008, Osamu Shimomura, Martin Chalfi and Roger Sien were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovery and development of the green fluorescence protein. So, we talked about this much. Let us take a look here. This protein is composed of 238 amino acids. It is called pent in a can because as I explained already and I am going to talk few words about that, it could have come in any and every color. So, the overall structure as you see is a beta barrel, but inside that if you could look here, you could have get that there is a alpha helix and the fluorophore is attached, the amino acids are attached in the alpha helix. Each monomer, it is a dimer, remember I, I, I was showing about some M's, so they are monomer, but initially it was a dimer. Each monomer composed of a central alpha helix surrounded by an 11 standard cylinder of anti-parallel beta sheets. Cylinder has a diameter of about 30 angstrom and is about 40 angstrom long. Fluorophore located on the central helix. So, what is a fluorophore? It is a protein, right? So, how the fluorophore come? This is the fluorophore. You look at this, the resemblance of amino acids. I am showing it. This is the crystal structure where you see the actual core active side where the mutations are going on. So, the core is actually coming from a amino acid, 3 amino acids, serine 65, tyrosine 66 and glycine 67. Deprotonated phenolate of tyrosine 66 is cause of fluorescence. I am going to show you. It is a foster cycle and proton transport to histidine 148. How we are looking at? These are the three serine 65, tyrosine 66 and glycine 67. So, initial oxidation happened and a auto catalyzing cyclization takes place. Then you get this thing here. 
the final fluorophore contains a series of conjugated double bonds. So, here I am telling you one story when Shimomura was working, he had a doubt that who is doing this catalyzation, who is developing this fluorophore because he was able to identify the fluorophore, but looking at that he understood that there is a series of reaction happened. So, he had idea that there is other enzyme present in that jellyfish who is taking care of the cyclization reaction, but it is a auto catalytic reaction no enzyme is required and that was understood when it was first expressed in E. coli. It was very fine very well and if you look at this rigid beta barrel structure they are very good to express very easy to express this protein. A series of mutation as I told I have tried to give you a map the mutation starts with the fact that when the wild type GFP in cyan lab in Rogers lab they have mutated serine 65 the part of the chromopore 2 threonine they see that they have made a mutant where the green fluorescence color is very very enhanced. So, they name it EGFP and you see this this color is indicating the mutants and what color they got like if you see the enhanced one have S205T I talked already about S65T in 149K Y147P in that way all this yellow, cyan, uh, blue all those colors are developed. So, these are some important mutant in enhanced GFP as I told S65T, but along with F64L in addition to that enhanced YFP, monomer YFP, citrine, ECFP which is enhanced cyan fluorescence protein, MCFP which is monomer cyan fluorescence protein all the mutants are here. And these are the mutated proteins with different color and how different you imagine you see this is not a artist's picture it is not any artist have drawn in the screen this is a petri plate coming from roger science lab where they have generated so many different type of proteins from GFP and they apply them to generate this picture in the so it is a it is the bacteria the E. coli grown in a petri plate. And the revolution was further when there is a commercial plasmid PGLO. The PGLO is a plasmid with circular DNA can be transformed into bacteria and independently replicating. So, you have the plasmid, you put your gene, you put it into bacteria, you put it into other organism and you track that with the expression of the green fluorescence protein. It is ampicillin resistant, so you could mark it. Here the GFP on the plasmid is inducible by arabinose which means that the gene is not fluorescent, the protein is fluorescent you could produce the protein by regulating arabinose. So, the GFP is under the control of a tightly regulated system on the plasmid and the GFP will only be turned on when arabinose is present. We have change the way we look at biology it have revolutionized now you know we started with green fluorescence we have so many fluorescence compound in our hand giving us so many options. I would say it is one of the best innovation 
to further proceeding of the biological research. So, with that I would like to finish in this class I have tried to discuss the important point of fluorescence, how the electronic transition happened, how singlet ground state to excited state and returning is giving by releasing of energy is giving you fluorescence. On the other hand the transition from singlet to triplet and coming back is giving you phosphorescence. What about the shift, energy shift which is Stokes shift and then you go for you see that the fluorescence how it is quenched, how the quenchers are affecting static quenching, dynamic quenching, stern volmer plot and then fret, how fret is used as a probe and what are the dependence of the fluorescence and associated things and last but not the least the green fluorescence protein which have changed the way we are looking at biology today. Again I request all of you to listen to the classes, I request all of you to send us the questions, we will try our best to provide you answer as much as possible. Please keep listening, keep asking questions, thank you very much.